Thank you, Dane. That was wonderful. Make those wise choices. I invite you all to please stand out of reverence for the reading of today's gospel lesson. Today's gospel lesson is part of the Sermon on the Mount, as it's recorded for us in Matthew's gospel, the seventh chapter. Hear now these words. Everybody who hears these words of mine puts them into practice is like a wise builder who built a house on bedrock. The rain fell, the floods came, the wind blew and beat against the house. It didn't fall because it was firmly set on bedrock. But everybody who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice will be like a fool who built a house on sand. The rain fell, the floods came, and the wind blew and beat against the house. It fell and was completely destroyed. When Jesus finished these words, the crowds were amazed at his teaching because he was teaching them like someone with authority and not like their legal experts. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Has anybody ever accused you of running around like a chicken with his head cut off? I know I've been accused of that an awful lot, and I often wondered, where does that phrase come from? Well, it's really hearkening back to the days when people lived on a farm, and the quickest way to get your Sunday dinner was to go out into the farmyard and grab some unsuspecting chicken by its legs and slam it against a hard surface really quick and wring its neck off. And it happened so quickly that as the chicken's head came off, the rest of the body didn't quite register that it was dead yet. So the rest of the body would go around just flapping and running around in circles until it fell over dead. Now, I think often we can feel like that after a rough day, after a rough week, especially when we feel like we've had to do three days worth of work in one day, the pressure of deadlines and the pressure of chores and errands that are upon us in life. But what if that chicken with your head cut off syndrome lasts and lasts and lasts? What if we feel like that perpetually? It reminds me of the story that I read about a chicken, a chicken who is famous in Colorado. In the early 1940s in Fruta, Colorado, a farmer named Loyal Olson was told by his wife that his mother-in-law was coming for dinner that night. And she asked him to go out into the farmyard and get a nice chicken for her to cook for dinner. He knew that his mother-in-law especially liked the tasty meat in the neck of the chicken, and it's always a good idea to impress your mother-in-law. So he got the chicken, and he decided to cut off the head, leaving as much of that tasty neck on the chicken as he could to cut the chicken's head off as close to the top of the neck as possible. But instead of falling over dead, that chicken, after its head was cut off, kept flapping its wings around and took those feathers and covered them over its headless neck and then started pecking for food on the ground. His only crow was a gurgle. He kept walking around and pecking for food as if he was still alive. The next morning... Olson went out, and that rooster was still alive, pecking around, flapping its wings, walking around the farmyard like the other chickens who had their heads. And so Farmer Olson decided if that rooster was so determined to live, he would help him out. And he got an eyedropper, and he started to feed this rooster that the city ended up calling Mike with an eyedropper, dropping food through the gullet and allowing Mike to continue to live. 
when that headless rooster was still alive a week later, Olson decided he would take this rooster to the University of Utah where some scientists could do some research and tell him, how can this rooster still be living without a head? And what they discovered is that enough of the brain stem was still alive on that chicken that it was able to continue to live. A headless rooster. So Olsten and his wife decided they would keep on feeding this rooster with their eyedropper. Life magazine and the Guinness Book of World Records picked up on the story, and before long, the Olsons and this rooster named Mike started going the circuit around the country where people paid 25 cents a person just to see this headless rooster who was still alive. Mike, unfortunately, ended up dying 18 months later when he choked on some corn in a motel room as they were traveling back home. But every year, get this, every year on May 19 and 20, in Fruta, Colorado, there is a Mike the Headless Chicken Festival <laughs> celebrating this wonder. Now, do any of y'all identify with Mike the Headless Chicken? Michael's saying no. Sometimes I identify with Mike the Headless Rooster because sometimes I feel like life is just spinning out of control and I don't have enough brain capacity or time to process all of the information and to know really what I'm doing and what is going on in this world. Hundreds of emails flood my inbox. Text messages beat me on the cell phone. Podcasts are begging for me to listen to them. Books are lining my shelves and my shopping list that I want to get to and read. And in my hand, I can hold a little device known as a smartphone where I can Google or ask Siri to tell me any number of facts and data and news that I want to consume. All of this information is coming at me so quickly that my body and my mind don't have enough time to process it all. And I feel like sometimes I'm jumping from one thing to the other. That's when I feel like Mike, the headless chicken, that I've lost my head somewhere as it's spinning out of control with all of this information that I'm consuming and trying to understand. One of the most popular spiritual writers and speakers in our day is Richard Rohr, a Franciscan friar who lives in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And in his newest book, The Wisdom Pattern, he describes the times we are living in as an age of a crisis of meaning. Others have called it an epistemological crisis. Now, I know the word epistemological is not a normal word that we use in our everyday language, so I'm going to break it down for us. It's made up of two words, episcope and ology. And we all know that ology means the study of. Episteme is an ancient Greek verb that means to understand, to know, to get acquainted with. So epistemology is the study of how we know things, how we get to know fact from fiction, truth from falsehood, studying how we know things. The COVID-19 pandemic has exposed the severity of our epistemological crisis. We face this crisis and COVID-19 did not cause it, but it crystallized it for so many of us as the news of the virus spread globally, 
public health experts and government leaders naturally struggled to understand this new virus and how best to contain it. But the speed at which the information came to us, the good, the bad, the ugly, the speed at which it spread throughout the world led to imperfect data, errant projections, hastily written analysis, and contradictory recommendations. They were spread confidently, and they were spread quickly, resulting in a disaster of information about the pandemic, about the stay-at-home restrictions, about masks and social distancing. There were articles and studies and experts that you could find online, in the public airways, to support whatever view you personally wanted to hold. And the result was a deepening cynicism and uncertainty about pretty much everything. COVID-19 didn't create this frightening information dynamic, but it did bring it to light for so many of us. So how do we discern fact from fiction, truth from falsehood in this world of fake news and alternative facts and conflicting opinions? Some of you might remember the old food pyramid. It was first published by the U.S. Department of Agriculture in 1992 and the food pyramid was designed to help us understand the folly of eating fried foods and drinking sodas and eating sweets all day long, as Dane so excellently brought out for the children. It was a genius visual reminder to us of what a healthy diet looks like, of what proportions we need to eat of good foods and not so good foods. Hearkening back to the helpfulness of that food pyramid, Christian writer Brian McCracken wrote a book that he entitled The Wisdom Pyramid. And in that book, he presents a visual model for a well-balanced diet of information intake into our lives to help us explore a biblical faith-based consumption of information. I was drawn to McCracken's book and that metaphor of the wisdom pyramid because I believe that wisdom is something the world needs now more than ever. As I hear people getting angry and as I see our world dividing more and more, over the sources of information that we hold on to as truth. As we are trying to make sense of what's going on around us, wisdom is critical to our relationships with one another. Wisdom is critical to us bringing unity and sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ in this world. Wisdom is critical to help us heal from the physical storms we've been through and from the emotional storms that we have caused for ourselves and one another. So to begin this series, we first need to agree on what wisdom is. What do we mean when we talk about wisdom? Well, let me begin by stating what wisdom is not. Wisdom is not the same thing as knowledge. You know, our culture places such a high value on knowledge that we often confuse it with wisdom. Now, I'm not against gaining knowledge. I have two master's degrees. I believe in gaining knowledge. But we put such a high value on it in our society by asking people and wondering what people's IQ is, 
wondering who the brightest child is in a classroom, encouraging our children that they need to make good grades, no matter how high our IQ is, if we don't have wisdom, we're not able to make wise choices in this world. You can have the highest IQ. You can come up with cures for all sorts of diseases. You can win court cases. You can earn multiple degrees from prestigious institutes of higher learning and still be devoid of wisdom because wisdom is not the same as knowledge. You can have knowledge without wisdom, but you cannot have wisdom without knowledge. Dr. Warren Wearsby helps us understand a biblical view of wisdom when he writes, wisdom was an important thing to the Jewish people. They realized it was not enough to have knowledge. You had to have wisdom to be able to use the knowledge wisely and correctly. Here's an example, a simple illustration of the difference between knowledge and wisdom. We can know that a tomato is a fruit, not a vegetable. But wisdom is using that knowledge that you have to choose to not put tomatoes in your fruit salad. Wisdom is how you use your knowledge. This truth is illustrated in an old story about a money lender. A money lender who was about to throw a debtor into prison. But this debtor had a beautiful daughter and the lender offered to cancel this debtor's debts and set him free if the debtor would give to him the hand of his daughter in marriage. And so the money lender said, here's a test that I will give to you since the debtor was hesitant to do that. He said, I'm going to take two stones, a black stone and a white stone, and put them in an empty money bag. And then I'm going to ask your daughter to reach her hand into that money bag and draw out one of the stones. If she pulls out the black stone, you will be set free. You won't have to go to prison. You won't have to repay me my debt, but your daughter will become my bride. If she pulls out the white stone, you will be set free. You won't have to pay me back the debt, and your daughter can continue to live with you. If she refuses to pick either one of the stones, then you will go to prison for your debts, and I will allow her to starve. So the debtor and his daughter reluctantly agreed to this test. As they stood before the money lender, the money lender reached down in the ground to pick up two stones. And the daughter noticed that he picked up two black stones to place them in the bag, hedging his bets, right? The daughter then reached into the money bag and picked up a stone. But just as she slipped her hand out of the bag, she intentionally dropped the stone onto the ground. And she said, oh my goodness, look what I've done. Clumsy me, I dropped the stone. But that's okay. We can still know what color stone I picked up if we just look and see what color stone is left in the bag. The money lender didn't want to let on that he'd been so dishonest. And so, of course, her father was set free, and so was she. That, my friends, is using wisdom with the knowledge that we have, using our wisdom 
with the knowledge that we have. Wisdom is not the same as knowledge. And it's also not about morality and ethics. Now, wisdom, of course, is related to morality and ethics, but it's not the same. Remember those who challenged Jesus most vehemently were the scribes and the Pharisees, the religious and moral leaders of his day. They knew and they followed the 613 laws. The laws, however, became their idols. They worshiped the laws, putting the laws in place of God and forgetting that the laws were supposed to serve the people and help the people to love God and to love one another. Sadly, there are some who call themselves Christians today who fall into that same trap. They worship the Bible instead of seeing the Bible as a sacred tool that points us to God the gift of wisdom is needed, my friends, in order to help us to apply the biblical message to our lives. The Reverend Tim Keller describes wisdom this way. Wisdom is knowing the right thing to do in the 80% of situations in which moral rules do not provide clear answers. Wisdom, then, is the ability to make good judgments and right decisions. And I know many of us are reluctant to make decisions because we're afraid that we're not wise enough. We're afraid that we'll make the wrong choice. But the great theologian, Reinhold Niebuhr, asked for wisdom in a little prayer that many of you already know. A prayer that I want to encourage you to pray throughout these 30 days of this challenge it's become a classic used by members of Alcoholics Anonymous. God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. So how do we acquire this wisdom? We're going to explore that question in more depth over the next several sermons. But today I want to focus us on the first step. The first step is to admit that we don't know everything and that we need to look to God as the source of wisdom, as the all-wise and true one. That is why one of the guiding verses in my ministry has always been the Old Testament passage that Austin read for us today, Proverbs 3, verses 5 and 6. My dear grandmother encouraged me as a child to memorize that passage of Scripture and to let it guide me in my life. And I am grateful that I took her advice. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge God and God will direct your paths. We do not know everything the gospel lesson that we read today about the wise and the foolish builders echoes that same message when Jesus states, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like the wise man who built his house on the rock. The rains came and the winds blew and the streams arose, but the house stood firm because it built its foundation on the rock, on the wisdom of God's teachings. In a humorous but also tragic way, there's a story about a golfer that illustrates this point. A worldwide TV audience was watching the British Open back in 1999. Anybody remember watching that? I know my husband Richard did. It was held, of course, in Scotland. And it was the occasion of one of the greatest collapses in a major championship in the history of golf. A Frenchman by the name of Jean Van de Veldeville was six strokes and 480 yards away from golf immortality in that British Open. Just six more strokes and he would have won a major championship. He would have won a wad of cash 
and a permanent place in history as a champion. All he needed was to score a six on a par four. Now the hole was not an easy hole, they say. It was bisected three times by what the Scottish call a wee burn, a marshy creek. So all he had to do was to hit three short shots, putt three times, take his six, win the hole, win the championship, smile at the cameras, collect his cash, and go home. But here's where it gets funny and tragic. The book says, hit the iron, a relatively short iron, just to keep it straight in the fairway on that hole. A shot on that marshy creek needed to be hit straight. But he was feeling confident in himself and he decided to pull out a driver. Now the problem with a driver is you can't tell when you hit the ball exactly how long it's going to go. It's very unpredictable, they say. But he pushes that driver halfway to the Eiffel Tower, they say, from Scotland all the way to the Eiffel Tower. Now, he was only 240 yards to the green with nothing but deep grass and heartache in between. Now, the book says to just hit a short shot and get back in the fairway. The book says don't go on the green. Golf 101 told him don't go for the green. Every golfer watching on television, including my husband, was shouting at the television, don't go for the green. But what did he do? He said, I'm going for the green. And he pulled out a two iron. And the only way to hit a two iron, that distance would be to tee it up on the beach if you were trying to hit the ocean. He swings that two iron and it careens off the bleachers and it disappears into the marsh's tall grass. Grass tall enough to hide a buffalo The next shot lands in the water. And the next shot he hits lands in the sand. Now he's got five strokes against him. And he's not on the green yet. He's not playing now to win the tournament. He's playing just to tie and to get into the playoffs. Well, he makes his seven. But then he loses the playoff. Now, to make this mistake even worse, in December of that same year, he came back. He came back to film a commercial for a company called Never Compromise Putters. And the idea was to see if he could make a six using a putter. And guess what? On the third try, using only a putter, he made it. Now, I'll tell you that story because I want you to hear this. Why did he really lose that British Open when he was so close to winning it? He knew what Golf 101 told him to do. He had the knowledge. He knew what the book of golf told him to do. But he didn't go by the book. He went by his own opinion. 
by his own understanding. He trusted that what he knew was right, but he didn't obey it. If we want to be wise, if we want to grow in wisdom, we need to humble ourselves and lean not on our own understanding, but in all our ways acknowledge God. To know God's wisdom and to put it into practice. May it be so for you and for me. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.